everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So my name is Usama. I'm serving as the uh, resident chaplain through a partnership with Hartford Seminary here at Muslim Space here in Austin. And I'm really excited about our uh, halakha speaker today. Just a little bit of background. Our uh, uh, halakha series today. Uh, we, we This is a part of a four-part Ramadan halakha series titled the Human Dignity Series, uh, affirming and elevating God's honor to humankind. The goal of this series is to elevate the notion that all creation has been granted dignity from the divine, and it is incumbent upon all believers to uphold this dignity, not only to ourselves, but to others around us. And the four, we, we have four amazing topics one has, which has just been, has already been discussed as of last week, but touching on really fundamental issues, issues that are critical touch points in our humanity, uh, touching on things like gender-based oppression, racism, classism, poverty, environmental destruction, as well as not just uh, that environmental destruction, but how this issue, as well as many other issues, rob current and future generations of dignity. And this week, alhamdulillah, we have uh, a really special speaker touching on the topic of anti-racism, Islam, and human dignity, and how anti-racism has uh, an in integral foundation in the prophetic model, as well as the Islamic teaching. And so Dr. Ansari is a fellow chaplain, but more importantly, a mentor, an advisor, and most importantly, a good friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Ansari needs no introduction, but I've got I've got to do it for the sake of formality, which I don't mind doing at all. Uh, Imam Dr. Ba uh, Bilal Ansari is the director of campus engagement at Williams College and co-director of Islamic chaplaincy at Hartford Seminary and faculty associate in Muslim pastoral theology. Dr. Ansari offers courses in the following areas, Islamic law, contemporary ethics, Islamic ethics, prison ministry, Muslim pastoral theology, and Islamic spirituality. Dr. Ansari believes in the notion of shepherding as a Muslim form of institutional leadership and his scholarship and activism includes serving on the Institute of Muslim Mental Health, professional advisory committee and uh, work in the field of diversity, equity and inclusion. And I can really attest that it was Dr. Ansari's class on the prophetic model and Islamic pastoral theology that really just made me certain about Islamic chaplaincy. And so, as I mentioned, you know, that we're, we're in for a real treat, but without further ado, uh, Dr. Ansari, the stage is yours, sir. Uh, uh, we begin uh, with Oh, hold on. Okay. Okay. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, yeah, so I want to begin with uh, giving praise uh, to God, um, who I uh, try to uh, spend as much of my time uh, re remembering um, and trying to live my life uh, to the best of my ability, um, living out. Um, within the footsteps of the prophets that he sent um, on earth um, from the prophet Adam to, to the prophet Abraham, uh, Moses, um, David, um, Jesus is one of our prophets that we claim. Um, and also to the last prophet um, who was, uh, you know, Muhammad. Uh, the prayers and peace be upon all of them. Um, and their example um, uh, centers um, uh, the the example of what does anti-racism uh, work uh, look like? Um, what is it? Or what is or what is the ultimate um, meaning or meaning of that work? And so uh, I, I also want to you know. You know, think if you don't think human beings, you don't think God. So I want to thank you, like know, Osama um, uh, Malik, for the invitation. Um, um, you know, Muslim space uh, for making uh, this space. Um, so I want to thank uh, the organizers. Um, all right. So after thanking humans, then um, let us turn back. Um, so I want to focus on uh, my story, if you don't mind. Can I? Can I give a little bit of a, a narrative of, of my story a bit? Um, my story begins with a 
transformation of Islam member, uh, my father who grew up in New York you know, in uh, Harlem uh, and uh, listening to, uh, to Malcolm X on the street corner as a child. Um, he comes into Islam through the, through the door of the nation of Islam um, at a young age. Um, meets up with my mother who's uh, walking in the circles of New Haven with the like with some members of the of the like Black Panthers. Um, and so these two um, you know so, you know socially uh, just anti-racist like racism the focus uh, merge and they create uh, or or outcomes uh, me uh, as a child of these two and um, and then in the in the early like seventies was the anti-racism work of like trying to like desegregate to like desegregate schools. Um, so I was in my apartment uh, like a lot like I was in an apartment um, like complex. I was one of the ones who my neighborhood was cut in half and on the slimmest part of the half of the neighborhood where, where I lived got bust um, to the all white schools. Um, my brothers, a few, my brother and my sister, um, who were living in the same house, but we moved across the street. They went to the all black school um, and so did not attend um, school with me. And so I was able to continue in the all white school. So my, the point of that telling my story is, is that my childhood and my, and my upbringing uh, race um, was a part of my uh, um, my uh, my earlier uh, my earlier my early like awareness. My mom, my mother recalls coming going to like the, you know like a, to my parents' night and uh, learning that I had changed my name. Um, she, my teacher and classmates called me uh, a name that I made up. I, I think it was like like a I think I changed my name to like like a to to like to um, Mark or like a somebody who lived on the street that had a house and a two car garage and a white you know picket fence. But I just figured like I, I wanted to be uh, like Mark and have a nice green lawn and a nice you know picket fence and you know so whiteness was a part of my my early uh, like awareness uh, early as a child even to the point where i changed my name i no longer wanted to even identify um later in the sixth grade is when uh it really hit me that that was not a possible that was not possible despite internally working towards that or trying to like erase uh, my identity. I remember being invited to a skate party. Uh, a friend of a friend of mine, Andrew, was having a skate party. His mother was the manager of the local uh, like roller rink, um, and so we were all gathering in his um, in his like basement, waiting to take uh, like a to, to be you know driven over to the um, rink. And so we we're all downstairs in the basement, and, and at the time we were all playing uh, like Atari because uh, that was the that was the game console at the time. I remember I was waiting for my turn on Atari, so I put my gift down and I, I went to and I sat on the couch uh, to wait my turn. And his little brother, who's like I had to be like five or six years old, I can remember was bouncing from couch, you know, kept to you know the couch. And then when he got behind me when I sit on the couch, he stopped and he looked and he said, "Mommy, who let this nigger in the house?" And I just, it just all went quiet and all eyes towards, turned towards me and everybody, everybody in the room had a smile or a smirk on their face and either laughed or, but for me, for the first time in the sixth grade, I realized I was different. I, I, I was, I, I was other. Um, and there was some type of narrative that I wasn't a part of. Um, I remember 
going to the party, but just not being there. You know how you're there, but you're not there. You're, you're somewhere, somewhere else. The music, I love to dance. So the music was great, I remember. But I was just in another, because I, I could not wait home to go home to my Black parents and, and ask about this feeling that was so disturbing in my soul. Like, what is this? Um, um, and my mother, I remember having that conversation about um, Blackness um, for the first time in America. I remember or, or like then being introduced to like roots and um, and then just having those intimate uh, like you know you know conversations. And in seventh and eighth grade and all the years years after that, it was really a struggle to get back that 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 purity of innocence of being like vulnerable, of wanting to to go into spaces where you dialogue and be with the other like. It was a struggle to get that back because um, because the pain was real. Um, the hurt and the harm uh, really shut shut it it shuts you off um, to want to be open. Um, and so um, I go now. I go to college, and in my college years, I'm reading all these books about uh, the history of of the Moors and just the, just the West African you know, like nations. So really, I'm, I'm wearing, you know, like red, black, and green. I'm listening to all of the, you know, the, the um, 90s, you know, black, like awareness music. And it's really, really getting into myself. And then the Rodney King, um, the Rodney King like event uh, happened and the, the beating and, in the trial, and then the, uh, and then the, the verdict, um, and then everything goes up in smoke. Um, and at that time, now I'm in college, and now I'm at the, that time the leader of the BSU, and we're we're organizing, and so we organized the protest, and we shut down the like Bay Area, the Bay Bridge. Um, so now I, that's how I, that's how I begin my anti like racism work um uh at the time of my own coming into my awareness but at the same time i was i was also really becoming um capable of being uh, being uh, vulnerable again um and being okay with having difficult uh you know like dialogue like around race and the meaning of um, what it means to be be anti-racist, um, and so as that identity and, and um, journey um, uh, came at, at that at the same time where I I chose uh, the, the religion of Islam. Um, um, again, my mother grew up in a black church. Um, I love the black church. Uh, 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 still to this day, uh, like the uh, the like the uh, the uh, the like gospel music um, takes my soul to a very uh, special place of peace and like and like, and like tranquility. Um, nothing does my soul any more good or benefit than the songs that my nana sung. Uh, while she stood over the stove making grits and eggs and homemade applesauce and and biscuits and and hair those pink hair rollers and her hair and and and, and I can just see and hear her saying, "Lord, I need another touch. Yesterday's touch is almost gone." But if you give me another touch, I have the strength to carry on. Those old uh, Negro hymns that just kind of uh, have that deep meaning um, of taking you through the every day to day. And I, I would find that they were attached to ancestors that this is how they survived. <laughs> um, 
darker times, heavier times, deeper times, more restrictive times. Um, this is what carried them through. And so it was a rich tradition. And, and, and when those were sung, it took me to a special place. And so I, I came to Islam, but um, still, I, I did not, I don't think, uh, I did not, I did not like, I have to like, uh, I didn't, I, I don't believe that I had to culturally like, a, I didn't have to like apostatize my cultural uh, richness of, of, of my blackness, of the black like religion that, 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 that my ancestors um, survived uh, this American um, peculiar <laughs> institution. Uh, like racism, um, uh, and so Islam. When I was ex when I was examining it, I was examining it through the autobiography of Malcolm X, <laughs> and Malcolm X, uh, I thought was uh, my hero. Uh, he was brave. He spoke the truth against um, tyrants at all costs. He 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 ultimately knew that he would it would cost him his life and. Um, but, but in the ancient, uh, but in the old, the old Greek meaning of the word martyr, um, he was going to be a witness. <laughs> um, he was going to be a witness for the truth, um, despite um, the the end. Um, um, as Jesus um, turned over the the uh, the like money uh, our tables in the church and. Um, told his 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 like disciples to change your whips for swords and guard. And I'm going to go into the uh, garden, but be on watch. And they slept. And, but he was a witness, uh, you know, for truth. And I felt in that prophetic way, um, I was looking for something you like you like similar. And in the and in Islam, I found the story of Bilal. And so. This is where I, I took on the identity of Bilal as my identity because Bilal is the anti-racism story that centered uh, within Islam. Bilal was a, uh, an African slave that, that was in Mecca and one of the kind of elect, uh, the ruling class um, owned uh, a Bilal and it was very harsh and uh, used to like uh, like like torture, uh, uh, like like Bilal because Bilal was the was a part of the early community who heard about Islam uh, really early and uh, and embraced it. And and his the the enslaver of of all of Bilal did not like that, and so he he used to torture. You you don't convert without my permission. You're I own you, and so Bilal resisted that. He he fought against that, and he he affirmed his belief in uh, like the be one God. But there was this best friend of the like Prophet Muhammad, you know, who was Abu Bakr, um, who um, spent all of his wealth liberating slaves, purchasing them, and like liberating them, the poor and the weak and the marginalized. He spent all of his wealth, you know, he, uh, he was a, a like merchant and and his father said, why are you squandering your wealth of um, doing this, doing this anti-racism work? Like, what is the matter with you? Um, I raised you to be entrepreneur. You learned all of the, um, the, the you, you've learned the liberal arts of, of what it means to be successful here in this society. Why are you doing this? It was it was out of a deep uh, light that God has had placed in his heart that um, serving and taking care of those who are marginalized and who are who are hurt and uh, who are who can't help themselves, helping them, then God will help you help you by doing unto others. God will do to you so giving help to others that God would ultimately give you um, help. And so he spent his life that way. And so ultimately Blau became like liberated 
and became very, very, uh, very, uh, uh, like, like, a, like a central within Islam. He became the caller to prayer, and he also collected the um, poor uh, tax or the or the, the like zakat or this 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 annual uh, 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 two point five percent of all of the wealth of Muslims to distribute, you know, um, to other poor people. So he had a central role, um, and so this anti-racism story. Um, is connected to my identity. I, so I adopted that name um, because it kind of spoke to, to, to an identity that I wanted to live in and like center my life around. And, and so I, I've been fighting anti-racism uh, or I've been fighting to kind of build anti-racism like a like coalition my whole life, whether it's in affordable housing um, whether it's in like universal healthcare, all of these things are are trying to get at the the structures of racism, the systems of oppression that 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 collect, that collectively strangle uh, the life um, and the human uh, like uh, you know uh, you know dignity um, from people. Having a, having housing that is affordable, um, this is about dignity. Of um, human beings, and so um, I spent many years, you know, fighting and building uh, like affordable housing in both Massachusetts and in my home state of uh, of, uh, of New Haven, Bridgeport, Hartford, uh, all of, all all of everywhere I everywhere I could, I was uh, trying to build affordable housing. Um, and then I fought for a, a, a universal health care that was passed in my state before before uh, uh, there was Obamacare. Um, and so we fought it. Uh, all of the like faith leaders have united because again, this is about human uh, like a dignity. Both my grandparents died at the age of 58 years old because of poor health, um, whether it was like diabetes or a uh, heart attack or um, just a lack of uh, health care. Um, and our family suffered because of that loss. The, the, the dignity of our family was, I mean, it just dropped um, and, and shattered in pieces. And we've been trying to put back the pieces because they were so central. Um, 50, 58 years old, gone. And so uh, giving people the right to have health care, to have a right to be, be treated as if their human life matters um, is a, a way. I worked inside of the prisons. Um, as a prison, um, uh, I was a, 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 a like chaplain from 97 until the year like, like 2011. Um, uh, in both male prisons and also in like female prisons, um, in both state prison and also in like federal um, prison, in maximum security, medium security, and also like minimum and uh, minimum security. Um, I served um, because they were the least of these. <laughs> uh, I figured people in prison was like the the urge of the scripture to serve the least of these. Uh, um, and so that became my effort at bringing human, like a, a, a dignity to people. Do you know that 75% of people in prison eventually go home? And so um, I figure um, what better way of transformation, what a better way of, of showing care and, um, and, um, and uh, helping um, bring back the human you know, dignity than uh, serving within the um, prison, those who people have, uh, you know, like forgotten. Uh, and in my lifetime, prisons in America, uh, when I was born, there was about 200,000, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, 200,000, you know, inmates across the nation. At, the, at where I am right now, it's like 2.5 million 
uh, people who are incarcerated um, in the carceral system. Um, um, and the system of, of prisons and where I think isolation um, is really uh, a form of torture. I, I, I don't believe that people should be isolated for 23 hours or uh, six months. Or even, some people are in there for six years or more in total isolation, 23 hours a day. Um, uh, I think that's just a um, horrible way to treat a human being. Um, <laughs> Jesus taught us to love thy enemies. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if that can be classified as love, um, uh, how we treat, be like, be like prisoners. Um, and so, uh, again, um, uh, uh, so the anti-racism work is, um, can be found in all of these ways in which you can serve every day. You can do something, um, whether it's volunteering at a prison, whether it's a given um, uh, or working towards um, better housing, working uh, towards the voter rights that is being actively suppressed across the nation. Uh, 34 states have enacted le le legislation to suppress uh, black and brown votes all across the nation. Um, these are ways that um, to take away a person's right to participate in this this project of ours um, of having a voice, a vote, um, is taking away dignity, the human you know, dignity. Um, and my my ancestors bled, <laughs> uh, fought, and bled and marched, um, prayed with their feet uh, for years to have the right um, to vote. Um, and this is being collectively um, worked against. And so anything you can do where, where, where you are, be like Booker T. Washington, put your buckets down where you stand and serve to help the human you know, dignity. Uh, I believe that our nation is at a very troubling place. Uh, and if you can help to kind of restore, uh, restore, uh, uh, your local town to a, a more just environment. Uh, this is a, this is anti-racism work um, that's necessary. Um, uh, there was a, a vote just this week in Florida that the governor of Florida just voted to um, just voted that if a person in a vehicle runs over um, protesters where there's three or more protesters that it was be, that person would be granted immunity. Uh, the governor of Florida just, just voted on this, just this last week. Uh, what is going on in our nation? And he had a press conference as if it was something to be proud of. He's very transparent about this. It's just, uh, he should do this thing, do these things in, you know, and hidden, but um, uh, uh, this is this is um, this is against the human dignity as for us as Americans. Um, uh, this bothers me as an American, not even as a, a black man. It's just I just 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 being a part of the American project. Like my great grandfather and my grandfather fought. You know, World War. You know. Two, <laughs> World War One. It's like, like we're better than this. Um, and so, anti-racism work um, is alive and well. Well, um, here in America, there's something for everybody to do. Um, you can be doing something um, in your local police stations. Um, we in the town where I live. Uh, we've been working with the racial justice and like and like a racial justice and like and there's this like there's a there's like a police reform group and we have fought and fought and we've got this 
we the um the um the like a uh, chief of police just resigned in my local um, um you know community this this dispatcher who used the n word in this towards a black woman um, who was in the was within the police station just uh, resigned um the town manager um who sanctioned all of this um uh, just uh, resigned and so there's something that you can do even in your local towns <laughs> unite with like-minded people christian jews muslims people who are atheists just good meaning people who are willing to do do to do the good of of anti uh, like racism work um um uh there's ways that you can change um and, and right now we've got uh like a social worker hired um in town to take the mental health calls um and so that police officers um who really who really are are, are under um, trained um, um, to to handle mental health calls. They don't. Know, they 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 haven't been educated to discern um, when a human being is is under mental uh, distress. Um, it's not a threat to, to to them. There's no need to fear to feel fear. Um, you should feel compassion or empathy um, and get them. Uh, a mental health care uh, like provider. So we've we've hired a social worker. Matter of fact, we've hired two two in our town. Um, so this is what we're doing. Just post George Floyd, we're just common, good-hearted, like minded people doing the anti like racism work. Uh, and I'll I will conclude with this last thing. One of the uh, one of the last protests that I led in my town was. Uh, there's this um, part of my town, it's a, a, a neighborhood uh, that's a part of my town um, that had in their deeds um, the racist um, uh, clause that these, the houses in this uh, neighborhood can only be sold to white people. It can never be sold to non-white um, and not even domestic people could stay over a night. It, that was even in the deeds and it's still into the deeds to this day. And so we marched on this uh, part of the neighborhood and to get these racial, uh, racist uh, things, uh, to have a line struck through them in the deeds and to put another line underneath to affirm that we're about diversity, we're about inclusion, about every day, you know, reclaim that. Don't, don't, don't just leave that, leave that undone. And, and you know, I'm grateful, you know, to God that these these neighbors responded, and they've put together some legislation for my whole state. So that legislation is moving through the. So Massachusetts is going to, because there's barriers. It, we found that it was difficult to remove those because uh, they put barriers there. And so my state now is passing a legislation to remove those barriers. So those uh, those towns that are in Massachusetts where those uh, where those race, racist comments are in those deeds could be struck through and, uh, and changed without any of those barriers. And so these are just, you know, some of the practical ways that I wanted to just uh, share with you as a faith like practitioner um, who uh, takes takes anti-racism as as a part of my identity, a part of my name, a part of my like I've been called, you know, to this work. I kind of I grew up and emerged in this time, and I'm just blessed to be living in this time and to continuing the work of those who came uh, like before me, and uh, and um, yeah, trying to serve God the best way possible. Um, so I'll stop here and. And uh, if anybody has any theol, if you want to ask me any theological questions, I didn't give a theological talk because, you know, I, you know, I, I wanted to be, be as grassroots as possible. And if you want to ask me where where this all emerges out of my tradition, I'm happy, to, you know, you know, you know, like like uh, you know, to answer. But know that this emerges out of my 
following my nana, <laughs> my black grandmother, um, and her spiritual hymns. The this that's the truth. That is the that is the source of sources in my soul. And so, that's why I thank you for the opportunity uh, to share. Thank you so much, Doctor. I'm sorry that that was that was an absolute gem. It was such a such a privilege to be able to hear your story, um, hear about your nana, but also um, hear about how that uh, anti racism work doesn't just look like one thing. We might we might just you know just silhouette it and think this is what anti racism is, and I might be able to do it. I might not be able to. But how you highlighted things from uh, housing inequality, housing discrepancy to mass incarceration all across the board that there's there's a piece of the pie for everybody to get involved. I really appreciated that. Um, I've got some questions that, that were sent here. So uh, as tempted as I am to, to pick your brain on some of the uh, the theology aspects, I'll, I'll hold that back a little bit. Um, but the question comes up here that uh, can you elaborate on how the freeing of slaves rose with the spread of Islam and why that was such an encouraged practice within the early uh, or the first community of Muslims, this practice of freeing slaves and how it might tie to this anti-racism model or framework that we're looking for? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So, um, yeah, so, it, you know, the freeing of slaves, uh, again, in the practice of, of of the early Muslims from the very beginning, all the way throughout the life of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, you know, um, you know, peace and blessings of God be upon him. There's examples of this within the the um, Quran itself. It encourages it as a way uh, to uh, inculcate this habit of uh, liberating the slaves and taking care of. You, you know the orphans and the marginalized, and so the the enslaved were a part of that um, that looking after as a continuation of the scriptures before the least of these. Um, it's a part of that tradition, the prophetic um, um, uh, 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 um, a, a, a system of breaking down. Um, anything that uh, reduces the dignity of the um, human being, um, uh, where the meek shall inherit the earth. The earth. And it's hard for a wealthy man to get into par a paradise, but like the pass into that. So all these things that kind of flip the paradigm on, of what the materialistic kind of like worldview is, is. And so the freeing of the slave is one of the means and methods of 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 spiritual um heights um uh, this is a way to liberate your own soul <laughs> by liberating the soul of the other um is a means of also um liberating um your own soul as we know that um slavery in america has been a uh, been abolished on the books um, I would argue the industrial prison complex is nothing more than a continuation of slavery um, here in America. The, um, the, the unlawful uh, uh, human um, life that is smuggled um, still to this day, um, children um, uh, throughout uh, or like um, throughout, you know, throughout our land, um, it's still a problem. Um, and so, to have the false sense that um, because it's off the legal books that it doesn't exist is again a false. Uh, it's uh, it's a false sense that uh, that our work is over. Um, I, I, I would challenge us to think that our ace, our our, our our anti-racism work of freeing slaves and uh, uh, liberating um, the uh, the uh, least of these is still a part of our work, um, just as it is it encouraged um, within our tradition. Um, don't think that it's that's that's past. That's something that um, it, it no longer 
no, you don't no longer need to take heed of it. All those examples that I've that I have um, shared are ways in which you can still uh, liberate um, uh, the enslaved. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely love that. Keep, keeping that keeping that relevant because that's that's so true. That's so true uh, in terms of the. You know, sl slavery and as a term might have been gone away or it might have been default, but it just has a new form, shape or way to, to manifest itself. So I really appreciate you lifting that up because that's something that we have in our society every single day. But the terms might change, but the function is is still there. And so as Muslims, you know, lifting that up, uh, one, one thing that I also wanted to, uh, to ask you with regards to um is that you you've got a rich theology you've got a rich theology that you know not not only comes from the hymns of, of your nana but you know from your background and just you know being able to experience not just faith in so many different uh ways and varieties and so you you, you poured out some good rich gospel good uh hebrew bible in in combination with uh the the islamic and the prophetic so i'm, I'm really curious about whether, you know, in terms of your message to other Muslims or people of other faith, uh, when, when it comes to like my, my, my theology or my faith is the only one that kind of matters or the one I can draw this, uh, this anti-racism framework from, uh, what, what do you say to folks about being able to reach to other theological traditions or the authenticity of being able to do so uh, in, in doing this work and, and whether there's any validation or validity in doing that? Yeah, no, I think that's a, you know, I think that's a, you know, that's a valid question. That's a good question. Um, so, um, like you learned in my my prophetic biography course, um, I think that um, my theology of care uh, is, um, and uh, my theology of uh, of interfaith. Uh, here uh, is centered on the idea that um, I'm going, there's nothing preventing me from doing anything other than if that thing that I'm doing um, brings about a conflict or brings uh, my understanding of my prophet uh, Muhammad or what he brought to be uh, like a lie or 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 something um, that is that that is claimed that um, that is a that goes directly against what my prophet uh, Muhammad uh, did brought said um, and if you look and examine his life, um, <laughs> he he was rahmat al alamin in the Quran. He was the Quran says he was a mercy to all of creation. Uh, rahmat al alamin, and that rahma, that mercy, um, that compassionate presence, um, um, I think it even extended out to his example. With even like plant life and uh, 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 like the environment, and, like like everything that uh, that he approached, he approached through that lens of compassion and care. And so, um, with that as my frame, my theological frame of life reference, um, I'm not concerned where you are theologically, or, or if you even have a theology, or if your theology is, a, is an anti-theology or an atheology, you have an atheological uh, art position. I just, my concern is just to, can I be with you where you are? <laughs> and can I be a means of uplifting and elevating your spiritual state where you are. If you're in sadness, can I take you to a place of happiness? Can, it, can, can I be, if you're thirsty, can I get you some water? <laughs> if, you know, um, if, if you haven't laughed in days, can I tell you a joke? 
<laughs> you know, I, if if you're bedridden, can you stand up and dance with me? <laughs> can, you know, can we just walk around the hallway and just move a little bit? Can, you know, uh, that where we where we stand, where we are, can we just find joy? <laughs> this is ministry. This is care. This is compassion. Um, and this is uh, this is my theology of care. Well, sp spoken like a true chaplain there, <laughs> walking alongside and journeying alongside. Definitely love that. Love that. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Brother Muhammad Kuba, uh, who just, uh, I think he'd just like to uh, uh, go off mic here. So, Brother Muhammad, go ahead, please. Hey, Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Um, yeah, thanks, Dr. Um, Bilal. Um, my question um, relates kind of to the event in Islamic history of the of Hijra, how, you know, the marginalized Muslim community, the early Muslim community, um, found it untenable to live in, in Mecca and, and migrated to Medina. And recently, there's been some talk of, uh, I think Charles Blow wrote in the Times, of uh, um, reversing the Great Migration in order to concentrate that black population in the, you know, the sub southern states and thereby, you know, having political power. Um, is, is that something like, you know, drawing from the um, Islamic tradition, is that something that, you know, makes sense to you or what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So again, my Nana was from Tennessee, Harriman, um, you know, Tennessee. And so it was a tradition of mine. I grew up in the North, but, but it was a, it was a tradition of my family that my nana and my grand uh, or my granddaddy um, made sure that the grandchildren got down south um, every 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 school break every every summer uh, we had to go get that culture that southern culture uh, that where they migrated north um, they wanted to make sure that that was still uh, that was instilled in us and uh, remember going to the to my uh, to where my nana grew up on uh, in um, Harriman, you know, Tennessee, where where her father built the house with his hands, and there was a mule and and, uh, and there was an outhouse. You had to walk in the backyard to go to the bathroom. There was this big tin can that sat in the middle of the house where you took the bath. You had to walk down the hill to get some water, you know, from the stream that you put on the fire to heat up and put into the big tin can. And so so that kind of southern life, that southern um, culture was a part of my northern ex experience. Um, uh, I, I liken that to the prophet's birth when he was born and they took him outside of Mecca to the kind of rural kind of areas to kind of get that kind of like pure uh, childbirth outside of Mecca, which was an urban, you know, like city. So there was this kind of like relationship of children being raised in that kind of uh, like a pure, you know, like environment. And so, um, so that, that, that is, that migration uh, is at the very like beginning. Now, what Charles Blow is asking me is for political aims and for, and for a sense of like um, uh, reclaiming uh, of, <laughs> of what we never really received that like, that like the real value of the like 40 acres and a mule. That was promised, but never really, uh, I never really gained. And so that really migrating uh, down, back down south uh, to kind of uh, to 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 kind of turn these red states, as Georgia just did, um, to kind of flip it, and so that uh, these pockets where there's overwhelming numbers of African Americans, where the vote is secured up north, strategically. Uh, migrate down south so that the numbers can be more uh, shifted um, for uh, more uh, political um, power and more security. Um, you know, I'm, I am, I am all, I am all, you know, for that. Uh, like Imam, uh, I worked in Muhammad. Um, uh, did that move years ago? There's a he, he created a city called like a uh in the south you know, like new medina um and they bought land and they built you know farms and 
it was on that idea back in the the eighties and the nineties of that same idea. Um, so Imam Alec Worthy Muhammad uh, was a was a was a was a head of the game, um, and so yeah, I'm all I'm all you know like I'm all you know for that idea, um, but I don't think it's just that that is one slice. That's that is one way of doing the anti-racism work. Um, but I'm not opposed, you know, to going down south. Definitely. Thanks so much for answering that, Dr. Ansari. And thank you for asking the question there, uh, Brother Muhammad. Really, really poignant. Um, and just uh, another question we've got here. I think we've got uh, a, a couple more. And then uh, if anybody else has other questions, we can definitely just drop them in the chat. But a uh, question came here, Dr. Ansari, that uh, as an immigrant to the U.S., not fully understanding American history, connecting all the dots with how insidious racism is in America, how can I learn more about becoming anti-racist? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good resources like anti, uh, like racism, uh, like booklets, uh, and anthologies um, that many people have done. Um, Maybe I can share a few with with like Usama Malik, and he can put it on on like Muslim space. Um, there's some very good like reading lists and some lectures uh, that um, some scholars who work in this field have like have like put together. I mean, very extensive, very good, uh, good uh, like reading. Um, and so I will go ahead and share those with Usama Malik, and we'll make those available. Sounds good. Sounds good. We'll, we'll definitely get that available to our attendees here. Um, we got a question here that says, it seems like a struggle to get folks to join the anti-racism movement. Uh, it seems like a struggle to get the uh, get folks to join the anti-racism movement is the subconscious notion that to elevate others would bring us down or that to distribute dignity means we lose a little bit of our own. What would you say to those who see dignity as a fixed sum? those who feel that for someone to get a bigger slice means they'd have to get a smaller one. I'm saying turn to Jesus for your answer. You need to turn over those money tables in your heart. <laughs> you need to kick out the capitalistic frameworks that's in your mind. <laughs> you need to turn to Jesus. I need to have a Jesus moment um, and turn over those money tables. Uh, listen, what is the profit of man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? There is no profit in any material gain. The, the true profit is the, the profit that you get after giving. Um, uh, that's when you really gain. That's when you are elevated. That's when human dignity is restored. The more you hold on to, the more constipated <laughs> you become spiritually. And you need to let that go. You need to, <laughs> you need to take a spiritual uh, relaxant or whatever. <laughs> you need to let it go. Um, and let let go and let God, as my grandfather used to say, watch watch God work. You know, uh, give and uh, watch God work. Good measures pressed down, shaken together. Uh, but listen, I, I I bear witness that that the more I give, I don't know where and from whence it comes, but it just keeps coming. I don't. I just don't know how. I I just can't the, I, the the windows what is that verse in the Bible it's like that I don't have room enough to receive it the windows are just that I, it's just too much listen change the paradigm flip the script um it it is going to be okay if whatever you have to do just work at getting that get, getting rid of that paradigm that, that 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 is a that is bondage that that is that is bondage um uh, and i i pray for you your liberation of your thought and your heart um because uh man 
once you realize the gift of giving, what generosity gives, what a grace from, what a grace that, that you will receive. Love, love that analogy and love the, uh, the metaphor of the uh, money tables inside the heart. We, we see scripture tell us the body is a temple and some temples we get uh, those money tables in and we've got, we've got a clean house. We've got to flip them out. So I, I really appreciate that, Dr. Ansari. Um, so I'll give uh, just the last few minutes here. If anybody has any questions, like I said, you can drop them in the chat. You can uh, just unmute and you're welcome to verbalize it there. Uh, in the meanwhile, Dr. Ansari, any kind of takeaways that you feel would be relevant for this audience and for folks who are watching live stream or in the future, just some lasting things you'd like to just part off with um, for us as a call to action, especially in the aftermath of not just this past year where racial injustice, anti-racism work has really come to the forefront. But again, with the uh, Derek Chauvin trial, we're, we're reminded that uh, the work's not over. You know, we, we, there, there's small W's here and there, but the, the work's not over, it's just getting started. So any, any things you'd like to lift up with us as we, as we close out today? Yeah, no, I, I, I just want to just encourage um, uh, the Black uh, folks who uh, may be going through and experiencing things that uh, we come from a tradition of, um, uh, of don't let that, that hate, um, don't let it occupy your plate. Forgive, let it go. Don't let it consume you. Forgive, let it go. Pray for them. This is this has been a blessing for us, for my people, and for white people who experience privilege. Utilize your privilege um, to help liberate folks. Um, don't be ashamed of your privilege, but just use it for the glory of God. Um, use your privilege for the upliftment, uplifting of other people. Use your privilege to elevate your neighbor um, um, and to teach your next of kin um, what compassion um, for a fellow human being means and looks like. That's what I wanted to share. I could get that uh, in person. Amen. 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 I would do so uh, just like we do in, in Salah. We would say, Lao, Amen. I would give that. I would give that there. But Dr. Ansari, thank you so much for blessing the space, for dropping some gems. Uh, this is, as I've said, I've had the privilege to take a uh, class with Dr. Ansari and probably will pick his brain again for some future classes for this reason alone. Uh, there's just so much uh, beauty being shed here, but also on some really relevant topics. Uh, and yeah, he's, he's wagging his finger. <laughs> yeah, you you as my student, I, I, I'm gonna make this a student moment. I it. hope you don't. I hope you don't pick my brain. Uh, <laughs> I hope what's in my heart transfers into your heart. I mean, I, purpose, I, I hope that it's a, like a paidia, um, uh learning experience and not a picking your brain. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, that's that's what I hope is, which is a true education. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm coming for the heart too, so so you better keep both on watch. But uh, just just a, just a quick um, uh, shout out for next week, uh, inshallah. Like I said, this is a four part series. Doctor Ansari has uh, marked the halfway point. Next week we have uh, Doctor Camila Mutmin Rashad uh, joining us to continue that conversation. You see, Doctor Ansari giving a fist bump. That's right. Um, so Doctor Camila will be continuing the conversation on racism, but also talking about specifically white supremacy spirituality and tying that to our uh, human dignity and its roots in Islam. So it's a, bound to be a great conversation that we're going to put a pause on this time and we're going to pick up next week. But thank you all for being here. And inshallah, you can watch this recording on muslimspace.com.org slash Ramadan. So thank you so much all for blessing the space. And Dr. Ansari again, peace, brother. Take care. We'll see you soon. Peace and love. Peace and love. Peace and love. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as-salam wa rahmatullah.